Hello and welcome to today's live stream. I'm Ed Bottomley with the Michigan Medicine Department of Communication. A stroke occurs when the blood flow to the brain is interrupted. Someone in the United States has a stroke every 40 seconds and it's the number five cause of death and a leading cause of disability in the United States. But as many as 80% of strokes are preventable. This month, May, is National Stroke Awareness Month. And today we'll be focusing on mini strokes, also known as TIAs, with our panel of experts. More about them shortly. As you can see, today's live stream is being conducted remotely, so pardon any technical interruptions if they happen. And for those tuning in live, you can submit questions at any time, even now, by commenting on this video. But please note that your name or profile name will be visible to others participating. And finally, if you can't stay for the whole chat or want to share the recording with a friend, a video of the chat in its entirety will be available in a number of areas. It's on our Michigan Medicine and CVC Facebook pages, our Michigan Medicine YouTube and Twitter channels, and our Michigan Medicine LinkedIn page later today. So now, without further ado, on to our panel of Michigan medicine experts. If I could have you two introduce yourselves, Dr. McDermott, let's go first. Sure, thanks Ed. Uh, my name is Molly McDermott. I am a stroke neurologist and I serve as the medical director of the Michigan Medicine Comprehensive Stroke Center. Great, Dr. Sosner. Great, thanks Ed. Uh, good afternoon everybody. I'm Jamal Sosner. I'm an emergency physician and I'm the emergency medical director of the Comprehensive Stroke Program here at uh, the University of Michigan. Great, great to have you both with us and we have quite a few questions. So let's um, uh, kick off with this first question. What is a mini stroke? Uh, and let's talk about a TIA and why that also means you should act fast and what that acronym means. So let's, let's talk about those two questions first. Great, I'm gonna take that one. So uh, a TIA is a very specific medical term. A TIA stands for transient ischemic attack. Transient meaning that the symptoms come and then they go. Ischemic, meaning that a part of the brain is not getting enough blood flow for a period of time. So by definition, a TIA means there's a lack of blood flow to the brain, but it doesn't cause permanent damage. Now, that is different from a mini stroke. A mini stroke is not a medical term. A mini stroke is just a term we use in common conversation. And it can mean a couple of things. It could mean a TIA. It could also mean a stroke that you recover from so quickly that you don't have any permanent disability, or it could mean a stroke that you recover from with just a little bit of disability. In other words, a mini stroke. But when, when doctors talk about mini strokes, we are generally referring to transient ischemic attacks or TIAs. Now, Ed, you asked, well, why is it important to act fast? You've just told me that this is a transient event. This is a, a, an event that doesn't leave permanent damage. Well, at the time that it happens, you don't know that it's going to be transient. When the symptoms start, you don't know if they're going to persist or not. And so we recommend treating the symptoms of a TIA, just like you would treat the symptoms of a stroke. And that means if you have sudden onset weakness, numbness, trouble talking, new neurologic symptoms that start like this, sure, it could be a TIA, but it could also be a stroke. You need to call 911, get to the emergency room quickly. Thank you for that. And, and the follow on question to that, I guess, and you've touched on this a little bit, but let's talk a little bit more about the difference between a stroke and a TIA. Yeah, that's a really great, great question. So a TIA um, causes a lack of blood flow to the brain, and then that blood flow is restored before any permanent damage can be done. So if you do a CT scan or an MRI scan for somebody who's had a TIA, it looks normal because there's been no permanent damage. Whereas somebody who's had a stroke, uh, even though their symptoms may improve considerably, when you take a picture of their brain, you do see a little area of damage uh, because unlike with a TIA, permanent damage has been done. Now, they may still, they may recover fully and have no symptoms, but it's technically a stroke, not a TIA. Thank you, Dr. McDermott. Dr. Sosner, could you tell me what are the signs and symptoms of a TIA? 
Yeah, absolutely. Ed. It's a good question. And, and again, a lot of people try to, to try to think of TIAs and stroke in the very beginning as very different things. But what I want to impress upon people is that they're the exact same. So the symptoms of a TIA are exactly the same as symptoms of a stroke. Uh, again, the only difference, as Dr. McDermott pointed out, is that the symptoms of a TIA ultimately resolve on their own within a short period of time without causing permanent damage to the brain, whereas a stroke, those symptoms persist and may improve, but uh, in, in general, there's some damage that we see on imaging studies. So symptoms of a stroke or TIA, uh, just to you know, they're, they're both the same. It's going to be a sudden neurologic event that typically causes numbness or weakness to one side of the body. It may cause some degree of uh, changes or uh, deficits in speech. It may cause problems with vision. It may cause problems with balance. Um, that's why the acronym that you pointed out earlier is one that's very important, FAST or F-A-S-T. Uh, the acronym has two purposes. One, so if, uh, if you take the individual letters separately, F is face, so any kind of facial droop. Uh, a is going to be arm or leg numbness, weakness. Um, S will be some trouble with speech. And then the T is time, uh, as their acronym points out fast, because it's important to get to the hospital immediately if you have any of those symptoms, because the treatments that we have available for strokes can only be given if those patients present to the hospital as quickly as possible after their symptom onset happens. So again, either TIAs or strokes, you'll never know the difference up front. It's going to be important that if you have those symptoms that you get to the hospital immediately so we can help you through that and, and, and give you the treatment that's necessary to get you better. Thank you for that, Dr. Sosner. Very important, I think, to reiterate that, uh, you know, the symptoms can't be differentiated. So you need to get to, you need to get to. So the next question we have up, uh, Dr. McDermott, is a TIA a warning sign for something worse like a stroke? It absolutely can be. So first I want to, um, to kind of start with a caveat, which is that sometimes things get called a TIA when they may not actually be TIAs. So for instance, sometimes people's blood sugar can go really low and they can feel weak, even have weakness on one side of their body. And sometimes that gets called a TIA, but it's not. That is um, we would say symptomatic hypoglycemia, meaning you have symptoms from your low blood sugar. Similarly, sometimes people come into the emergency room with a severe headache and they have numbness on one side of their body. That can be called a TIA, but it's not. That's something called a complicated migraine. And so the, the first question is, was it really a TIA? And I think that uh, being at a comprehensive stroke center or a center with stroke professionals who can help figure that out can be useful. Um, so let's say it is a TIA. Let's say it's convincing for a TIA. Is your risk of stroke subsequent to that increased? Yes, in fact, it is. And that's one reason that we encourage people to come to the emergency room when, they're, when they think they may be having a TIA. So in, especially in the first couple of, of days after a TIA, the risk of stroke is higher. And that risk can be higher um, for older people, for people who have certain features of their TIA, like profound weakness or um, trouble talking, and can be uh, higher for people who have a TIA related to carotid artery disease. So there are certain features that can make it even higher risk in those subsequent days. Generally, we say that somebody who's had a TIA has a, has a greater risk of stroke than all comers. You know, if you compare it to people who compare that person to people who haven't had a TIA, the risk is certainly higher, um, but that risk is highest in the first couple of days and then begins to decrease over time. Um, so sometimes if somebody has a very high risk presentation, we actually recommend coming into the hospital for a couple of days so that we can watch and make sure that the symptoms don't progress to a stroke. Thank you for that. The, the next question that we have up, Dr. McDermott, can a TIA be seen on a CT or on an MRI? Yeah, very good question. So by definition, you can't see a, a TIA on a CT or MRI. So if, if somebody says, I can see your TIA here on your MRI, that's, that's you know, by definition, not true. That would be considered a stroke. It's just a stroke that has caused minimal symptoms, minimal residual symptoms. And then the, the next topic, um, again, to you, Dr. McDermott, to kick this off, could you tell me what age groups are at risk for TIA for mini strokes? Sure. So um, 
as with a lot of diseases, the older you get, the more prone you are to, to have. And, and so similarly for TIAs, we see them most often in older people. So we're, we're talking people in their 70s, 80s, you know, TIA is a common diagnosis in that group. Um, but, you know, we see people all the time who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s who have TIAs. So it's not exclusive to older populations. Um, it, it, it can really happen to anyone. Thank you for that. And, and the next uh, question, is there a difference between TIA symptoms between the sexes? That's a really good question. And I would say that the, the, um, the jury is out on that. There is some suggestion that women may present with sort of less specific symptoms. So maybe more, more likely to present perhaps with feeling weak all over or being confused. Um, but there's also a question of, well, is that how we're interpreting what they're telling us? Are we interpreting women's report of their symptoms differently than we interpret the men's report of their symptoms? So I think for doctors, it's useful to, the, the difference in presentation is not useful. You should, you know, you should be using um, wh whatever symptoms they're telling you, regardless of sex, it, that shouldn't be influenced. It's more of a kind of interesting academic question. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. The, the next question, I'll, I'll push this to Dr. Sosner first. What should so someone do if he or she suspects they might be having a TIA? Sure, that's a great question. And, um, you know, again, I'll impress upon people that um, you, when you have symptoms of a stroke or a TIA, they're the exact same symptoms. So again, I would never want somebody to stay at home and try to determine, am I having a TIA or am I having a stroke? Because it's impossible to know that when you're at home. It requires imaging, it requires people to come into the hospital. One thing that we didn't mention, and, and perhaps it's a good time to mention it, is that this is an exceptionally common disease process. And, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't get the therapy that they need because they don't come to the hospital. When you look at the United States, we have you know, on the order of about 680,000 people that have a stroke every year, and we have about 240,000 that have a TIA every year. So again, it's an exceptionally common disease process. And the biggest problem we have is that people don't understand that they need to come to the hospital immediately when they have these symptoms. It's never something that you say, well, gosh, I don't seem to be talking right, or my arm feels numb or weak. Let me take a nap and see if it's still there. If it is, I'll come in. That's that's the wrong thing to do. The right thing to do is as soon as you have those symptoms, just because you can never differentiate if it's transient or a TIA and it's going to go away on its own versus is it a stroke and it's going to cause permanent damage for you. You want to make sure that you you know activate 911, uh, call the ambulance, get into the hospital. That's very important. Thank you. Thank you. A very important answer. There, may, I, um, Ed, may, I, uh, may I piggyback? Yeah, please please do. Um, I think, you know, stroke doctors often say we wish TIAs, we wish strokes hurt a little bit um, because often they're not accompanied by pain. Often there's no, it doesn't hurt. Unlike say chest pain, heart attacks where people say something's clearly wrong. This is uncomfortable. I want to get to the emergency room. Often people with TIAs or strokes will say, well, it's not hurting. I'm going to wait and see if this goes away. Um, and so we often say, well, if, if, there, if only it was a little uncomfortable, maybe people would come to the emergency room more quickly. Yeah, that's that's a, that's an important note to to put down there too as well, Doctor McDermott. Doctor Sosner, what would you say? Uh, what is the treatment for a TIA, and what happens if you wait? Yeah, it's a good question again, Ed. Um, so TIA treatment again, we we treat them, we treat patients that are having any neurologic symptoms, like we do as a stroke. We have to assume that somebody's having a stroke at the front end of their treatment uh, until proven otherwise. Um, and so typically we have two major modalities of treatment for strokes uh, and TIAs altogether. So when a patient comes into the hospital, they immediately will be taken for a CAT scan to take a look at their brain, just because we wanna make sure that they're not bleeding or having blood in their brain, brain which can also cause neurologic problems that are consistent with an ischemic type stroke. Um, and assuming we don't see any blood, then depending on the significance of their deficits and whether or not they have a large blood vessel that's blocked or a smaller blood vessel that's blocked. We uh, either treat them with IV TPA, which is a clot busting medicine. Essentially, we give that through an IV. Uh, it doesn't hurt at all. We give that to them because our goal is to try to break up the clot that's, pre that's preventing blood flow to a part of the brain that's causing their neurologic problems. Uh, and again, if the, if the clot is larger, then sometimes we take them for a procedure uh, very similar to a heart attack. We'll go in 
uh, with a small uh, guide wire through their through uh, one of the blood vessels in their groin. Uh, it'll go all the way up into their brain. Our goal is to take out that blood clot to again restore blood flow. So our treatment is the same for a TIA or a stroke because at the very beginning we don't again we don't know if this is something that's going to be transient or uh, or more permanent. Yeah, so technically speaking, there's no such thing as waiting for treatment for a TIA because you don't know if it's a TIA or not. You should go in and, and see people like you and you can then make that judgment. Yeah, you're 100% right, Ed. I mean, there's nothing that a patient can do at home to figure out if it's a TIA or a stroke. That's a decision or that's, a, that's something we need to figure out in the hospital by doing imaging of their brain and doing other tests and trying to figure this out for them. It's not something that I would wait for. And in fact, what I didn't mention that's also important is these therapies that we have for patients that are having these neurologic deficits, be it either a stroke or a TIA, the patients do better if those therapies are given early or as soon as possible after their symptoms begin. So again, we have a we have a narrow time window that we can use for these patients, but if we don't give it at the very front end, we usually have less success in terms of getting them back to normal. Thank you, thank you for that. The, the next question that we have up, um, should TPA be given even if you're not sure whether a patient had a mini stroke or a heart attack? Can it hurt them? And what if the window is missed for giving it? Yeah, I can, um, I can start this question out. Ed. Um, so it's a very good question. Um, so again, it's, it's important to differentiate stroke versus heart attack. And, and um, you know, to the, to, the, to the lay person that comes into the ER, unfortunately, we as the medical community have not done as good of a job as we should to try to differentiate things. So a lot of patients that come and see me in the hospital, if I ask them if they've ever had a stroke, sometimes they'll say, yeah, I had to have a stent in my heart. And again, they're very different. You know, one is a problem with the heart, one is a problem with the brain. Um, so first and foremost, when patients come to the hospital, our job is their physicians uh, and providers is to determine if they're having a heart attack or a stroke. And as Dr. McDermott mentioned, you know, heart attacks are going to present very different. They're going to typically present with some degree of pressure in the chest, pain in the chest, shortness of breath, lightheadedness, passing out, things like that. Whereas strokes and TIAs will present with sudden onset uh, 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 neurologic symptoms. So loss of sensation, loss of power to one side of the body, uh, or the other uh, facial droop, difficulty with speech, difficulty with vision, um, uh, dizziness, things like that. So uh, very different in terms of what we do for patients. Now, uh, in terms of the treatments, as you had asked about, um, no, if a patient's having a TIA, uh, again, we'll never know that at the very beginning. So the treatment for TIAs and strokes are exactly identical, which is to provide them the therapy to try to dissolve the clot that's preventing blood flow to part of their brain. So they would be, you know, they would be given that medication that we referred to earlier called TPA, which is a clot busting medicine. In the past, we used to actually more often use um, a clot busting medicine, even for heart attacks, which is the other part of your question, is it gonna hurt if you're giving a clot busting medicine um, for a patient that's having a heart problem as opposed to a brain problem? Uh, in general, no, but that being said, we would figure out if they were having a heart problem versus a brain problem uh, very quickly upon arrival to the emergency department. So I don't think they would have to worry about us getting medication for a different disease process. Thank you for that, Dr. Sosner. The, the next question I'm gonna to push to you, Dr. McDermott, what are the after effects of a TIA? Can it cause permanent damage? Good question. Um, so no, by definition, a TIA is transient. So the, the symptoms resolve. If your symptoms don't resolve, it wasn't a TIA. But you know, uh, can it cause permanent damage? Not neurologic necessarily, but I would say that you know it's stressful. It's scary. If you have part of your body not working the way you want it to work, you're trying to tell your arm to move and it's not moving, or you're trying to talk and you're not able to generate appropriate language, that's really scary. And I think that you know, just because it's a TIA doesn't minimize that that can have a huge effect on somebody's life. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and this next question for you, Dr. Sosner, this is one we've touched on a few times. I think it's worth reiterating again. If you have symptoms of a mini stroke or TIA, can you assume that it is a TIA and that the symptoms will just go away? Yeah, that's a great question, Ed, and, and we get this a lot, unfortunately. So the problem with stroke, and Dr. McDermott pointed this out earlier as well, um, our main, our main um, 
our main problem is that patients don't come to see us quickly enough a lot of times to be treated. The treatment rates in the United States for stroke are really, really low compared to where they should be. Uh, and a big uh, reason for that is because people assume that if they wait, their symptoms might improve. They don't want to bother the healthcare system. They don't want to unnecessarily call an ambulance. And if, if we could get one thing across today, I think it'd be to impress upon our patients that are out there that if you have these sudden onset neurologic symptoms, the best thing you can do to help yourself get back to normal is to come in immediately to the hospital. There's absolutely nothing that you can do at home to determine if you're having a TIA and that your symptoms will go away on their own versus a stroke where, the, where you'll have permanent damage. Um, so again, the, the most important thing you can do is dial 911, call an ambulance, come into the hospital. Yes, thank you for that, Dr. Sosner. The next question for you, Dr. McDermott, if a patient is admitted to the hospital and they are discharged with mild but persistent symptoms of stroke, is that considered a mini stroke? Yeah, so, um, so mini stroke is a term that we use in um, casual conversation. It is not a medical term. And so a mini stroke can be an umbrella term for lots of different things. So if somebody leaves the hospital with persistent mild symptoms. As a physician, I'd probably say that it was a minor stroke. It, it, as a layperson, yeah, that was a mini stroke. It was a stroke that didn't cause significant disability, but it did cause permanent, uh, permanent damage. It would be incorrect to call that a TIA because you're, it's not transient, you're left with permanent symptoms. Yes, yes. thank um, you, thank you for that. Oops, sorry, Ed, I was just gonna add one no, more go thing. Ahead. To to, to that as well. Um, and and, and um, so Dr. McDermott and I see this a lot, which is patients or their family members, if a patient has had a TIA or a transient event in the past, unfortunately, a lot of times they don't come in the next time because they say, oh, the first time it was transient and it went away. So we assume this was going to be another TIA and it would just go away on its own. And again, we want to make sure that we uh, impress upon our, our, our audience that um, just because you've had a TIA, it actually puts you at higher risk of having a stroke. So if, if patients or their family members have had TIAs in the past and they come in and they have new neurologic symptoms, you never want to assume that it's another TIA and that it will just go away on its own. You automatically want to come into the hospital for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for those answers. Um, the next question for you, Dr. McDermott, what are the factors that put someone at risk for having a TIA or a mini stroke? Are people with certain conditions more prone to have them? Yeah, very, very good question. And this is going to sound um, familiar. The same risk factors that apply to stroke apply to TIA. So the same things that put you at risk for having a stroke put you at risk for having a TIA. Those include advancing age, which obviously we can't do anything about, sometimes family history, which we can't really do anything about, but there are things we can do something about. One of those, uh, which is very important, is high blood pressure. So one of the co most common causes of stroke and TIA is high blood pressure. So keeping, blood, keeping an eye on blood pressure, keeping that under control is a great way to prevent stroke or TIA and keep your brain healthy. Um, smoking is a huge risk factor for stroke and TIA. So trying to cut back or quit smoking can have just pay dividends in terms of preventing brain disease and just keeping your brain healthy. Then there are other things that um, you may hear about, maybe some of your relatives have. Um, atrial fibrillation is an irregular heart rhythm where the top chambers of the heart, instead of beating in a nice kind of concerted fashion, gyrate. Clots can form in those gyrating um, heart chambers. And if the clots escape, shoot upstairs, that can cause a stroke or TIA. So, um, so people with atrial fibrillation are at risk for that. And that can be treated with medicines. Um, diabetes uh, can be associated with, with having a stroke or TIA. Um, and then uh, certain illicit drugs, uh, you know, we have to mention it, um, can be associated with, with having a stroke or TIA as well. And, and my next question for you, Dr. McDermott, um, can a TIA be brought on by stress? Yeah, good. That's a really common question. And, and the answer is not simple. So um, stress can make any neurologic disease worse. So stress can make 
multiple sclerosis worse, it can make seizures worse, and in fact, it can make cerebrovascular stroke or TIA disease worse. Now, it probably doesn't do it directly. Um, when people are under a lot, a lot of stress, they often have uh, high blood pressure. And we've just said high blood pressure can be associated with uh, with an increased risk of TIA or stroke. Sometimes when people are under a lot of stress, they're not as healthy. Um, they're not exercising, they're smoking more, or they're eating more. Those kind of things can be associated with stroke or, or TIA. And then you've touched on these, and I feel like we've, we've touched on these a few times, but I think it bears asking the question straight out. Is there anything you can do to try and avoid being at risk for having TIA or mini? Yeah, good question. So the, the most, I would say the two most important things you can do are try to keep your blood pressure under control. That's a super high yield way to keep your brain healthy. And then to, um, if you smoke, cut back or quit. And if you don't smoke, don't start. So those are, I would say, are the two highest yield ways to prevent TIA or stroke. But there are other ways. So if you have this irregular brain uh, heart rhythm, like I've mentioned, atrial fibrillation, generally being on a blood thinner is an effective way to prevent TIA or stroke. If you have high cholesterol, uh, being on a medicine to treat that is an effective way to prevent TIA or stroke. And then um, it, it, some evidence would suggest that improved diabetes control, if you have diabetes, also leads to a reduced risk of TIA or stroke. So those are some, some um, medical ways to reduce the, the risk of stroke. And then um, just staying active, exercise, exercise and, and healthy eating. You know, we all know we're supposed to do it, yet it is very hard. Um, but those are, you know, important ways, not just to keep your brain healthy, but also to keep your heart and your, and your artery and arteries throughout your body healthy. So uh, exercise and, and, and uh, generally um, a, a diet that somewhat adheres to the Mediterranean diet, which you can look up online, uh, is what we recommend to our patients to help prevent, uh, to help prevent TIA or stroke. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McDermott. Fantastic answer there. Let's move on. We're, we're about half an hour in, and I'm happy to say we still have a, a good list of audience questions to push to both of you. The next question that we have coming in, what are some common risk factors for a TIA in young people in their 20s and 30s? Sure. So I think the first, the first uh, point to make is that even though TIAs can absolutely happen to people in their 20s and 30s, it's obviously less common than in people that are older. And so the first question is, is it the correct diagnosis? Because a lot of things get called a TIA that aren't really, and that can include complicated migraines or migraines with focal neurologic symptoms. That can include derangements of blood sugar or other electrolytes, um, seizures, uh, other things um, like that can be called TIAs when they're not actually. But let's say that, um, that somebody, um, you know, that, 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 that it, is, it is a TIA. It has been formally diagnosed by a, by a stroke doctor. That is, that is what it is. Um, it, 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 there are a lot of different things that can cause it. So some genetic uh, syndromes can lead to stroke or TIA. Um, some um, vessel abnormalities. So sometimes we can get tears in our blood vessels that can lead to TIA or stroke in the young. We're all, susceptible, we're all potentially susceptible to tears in our blood vessels. Sometimes people can have a uh, abnormality in their heart called a patent foramen ovale, which is a shunt from one side of the heart to the other, which can be associated with TIA or stroke in the young. And then, you know, a, a sizable proportion of the time, we just don't know why. We don't, despite all of our tests, uh, extensive testing, we don't figure it out. And some, and we, we're left to assume that somehow the stars just aligned on this day where this happened. And in those types of settings, the risk of recurrence is, is really low. Thank you for that. Anything to add, Dr. Sosner? I thought I saw you on mute for a second. No, I was I was going to say a lot of the same things as what Dr. McDermott said. She just said it a lot better than I would have. So I, know, <laughs> I, I agree 100%. Fantastic. Well, the next audience question that we have up is, is there, and I'm going to pronounce this word wrong, is there a migraine connection? Yeah, that is such a tough, that is such a tough, good question. That's a, t there's a, th that is a tough question. Um, there appears to be an association between migraine and stroke, but it's a, a little bit nebulous and we're, 
and and I should say that it is a um, so migraine is a condition that is exceedingly common. Um, millions and millions and millions of people have migraines, and the super vast majority of them will never have a TI or stroke related to that. By far, you are you know it, the chances are very small. Yet. Um, if you compare people who have migraines to people who don't, there is an, inc especially complicated migraines, which are these migraines that cause neurologic symptoms, there is a slightly increased uh, uh, prevalence of TIA or stroke. And, and we don't know, you know, we, we don't necessarily know how to modify that risk factor. Um, and we, and, and some, some studies suggest it's stronger than others. So, the, the answer is yes, there's an association between the, the type of migraine that comes with focal neurologic symptoms, um, but acting on that knowledge is difficult. Thank you. And thank you to the viewer for that tricky question. It sounds like we've got another relatively tricky question coming up, or at least to my eyes, it seems so. So you mentioned confusion with a TIA. How would you recognize this in someone who has dementia? I can take that. Uh, Dr. Bottomley, you are correct that that is a very tricky question. Um, anything, any, any kind of new neurologic deficits in somebody that has uh, dementia or some underlying um, neurologic problem like that is very, very challenging. That, and, the, and, the, and the viewer is asking a really great question. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times we don't know. Um, those are the patients that, you know, if there are new, new neurologic deficits, we'd want to have them come into the hospital. Um, confusion is very challenging because a lot of times it's going to be because of something other than stroke or TIA, but where um, sometimes we get confused, uh, no pun intended, on confusion is when patients are having things like aphasia or difficulty putting together words or sentences or uh, speaking properly, and sometimes um, that is confused even by some medical personnel as confusion as opposed to truly a neurologic deficit like aphasia. So again, I think what I would impress upon our audience is that if you do have a family member, a loved one that has significant medical problems um, that include things like dementia, where it's going to be challenging to know if there are new deficits, if you do notice deficits that are different than what they've had in the past and they're acute, I'd, lump, I'd want that person to come into the hospital to be checked out. Yeah, and I, I'd, I'd also like just like to reiterate what Dr. Sauser started with, which is that usually just um, confusion is not from a TIA or stroke. Most of the time, confusion is related to infection, dehydration, lab electrolyte abnormalities, um, other other neurologic problems. But usually, isolated confusion uh, is not from a TIA or stroke. Thank you. Thank you both for that. It looks like we have another, this, this seems like quite a technical question, so excuse my pronunciation. Do you have any recommendations for severe vestibular patients who suffer similar symptoms as TIA as part of their vestibular disease? Vestibular neuritis presents similar, spinning vertigo from BPPV, episodes from Meniere's, for example. It can be very difficult to separate. I agree. And, and I'll say the first time that somebody has vertigo, we don't generally know if it's from a stroke or TIA or from something like BPPV, vestibular neuritis, or Meniere's disease. To be the first time we, gen we genuine, generally don't know. And there are ways that there are certain exam techniques. Um, the neurologic exam can get pretty fancy, and we have some tricks to try to figure out if the vertigo, the dizziness is being caused by a stroke or is being caused by a problem in the vestibular system, which is located in our ears. Um, if we can't figure it out based on our neurologic exam, then we can get an MRI scan to make sure that we don't see any uh, areas that look like stroke on that imaging. Now, um, the, the, the type of dizziness you get from BPPV is very different from the type of dizziness you get from a stroke. So BPPV tends to cause a, uh, abrupt onset dizziness that's maximal at onset and then gradually gets better over about a minute. And it can be provoked by certain head movements like reaching up into a cupboard or turning over in bed. Uh, that's a classic 
feature for BPPV. Strokes really wouldn't cause dizziness that comes on over and over and over and over and over again, kind of the same way every time. That would just be too weird for a stroke. And so that's more likely to be BPPV. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. McDermott. The, the next question we have, what is an ear stroke? Is sudden hearing loss a sign of an imminent stroke? Additionally, can you talk about stroke within the eye? Is this a form of TIA? Sure. Um, so, so I'll start and then um, Dr. Sosner, please, please uh, fill in the blanks for me. So, um, so a stroke causing isolated unilateral, meaning one-sided hearing loss is possible, but vanishingly rare. So, so, um, if, so loss of hearing on one side that happens suddenly much more likely to be related to a problem with the ear than a problem with the brain. Much, 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 much more likely. Is it possible it's from a stroke? Yes but certainly that would be kind of low on your list. Uh, so that, that's uncommon. It can happen, but it's uncommon. Now, strokes to the eye or TIAs to the eye are very common. So, um, so and basically we think of them the same way, same way we think of strokes. So your retina is brain tissue. And so, and, and your arteries that, that feed your brain also feed your retina. And so if you have a little piece of plaque or blood clot that blocks the blood flow to your retina, you might stop seeing. And that's basically a stroke to the eye. If it goes away quickly, it's kind of like a retinal TIA. If it persists, we consider it an eye stroke. And so uh, for all intents and purposes, they're, they're, we largely consider a stroke to the eye as the same thing as a stroke to the hemisphere. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. Anything to add, Dr. Oh, uh, yeah, thanks, Ed. Um, I was going to say the exact same thing. We, we, see, we see patients that have some degree of transient deficits to their vision quite frequently, and, and it's challenging, right, because a lot of those patients also have ophthalmologists or optometrists and eye doctors, and so um, not wrong when they have a deficit to their eye. A lot of times those patients will call their eye doctor and go, go get seen by them, and a lot of times those eye doctors will refer uh, patients over to the ER to be seen because they're concerned that the patient may have had a stroke to the eye or a TIA or mini stroke to the eye. So just like Molly, just like Dr. McDermott mentioned, um, a lot of the times the, the treatment and subsequent kind of um, uh, risk factor modification that we use is going to be very similar if they've had those uh, uh, neural, those deficits to their vision. Thank you. Thank you both for those answers. The, the next question that we have up, is amaurosis fugo considered a TIA? Um, yeah, so amaurosis fugax is, is, is essentially a, uh, a transient vision loss, and that can be a lot of times a harbinger um, saying that, they, that the patient may have a stroke or something coming down the pipeline, very similar to a TIA. So again, very similar to our answer from previously, if patients do have sudden uh, loss of vision, uh, we'd want them to go to the go to the either to the ER immediately or if they can be seen by ophthalmology uh, immediately to have that evaluation immediately. And then subsequently, we want to make sure that we modify their risk of having any future neurologic deficits or stroke um, uh, following that. Thank you, Dr. Sosner. The, the next question that we have up Dr. McDermott, earlier you mentioned the Mediterranean diet and exercise. Uh, this person is asking if there are any other lifestyle changes that help minimize risk. And I'll throw them, I'll throw all these questions at you at once. Low salt diet, preventative meds, supplements, recommended number of steps a day, anti-inflammatory diet. Could you comment on those? Yeah, so I'll start by saying that some of this we, we don't know, and that's because these types of things are very hard to, to do trials about, right? It's hard to uh, have a, a group adhere to a, a good diet and a group not follow them for a decade and see who has a stroke. That's an expensive trial, a difficult trial to perform. Um, so a lot of our, our evidence about this is based on observation, meaning we look at populations and we say, what are these people doing that's making their stroke risk so low? Uh, and that's that's one reason that the Mediterranean diet has has uh, garnered a lot of appeal. There was a trial looking at the Mediterranean diet that looked pretty favorable for it, um, but that's it, it's weak evidence. But when you look at the list of what you're supposed to eat on a Mediterranean diet, you're like, okay, well, I you know I knew I know I'm supposed to be eating that. Um, so other things. Um, 
step count, we don't have any evidence that a certain step count is important uh, in preventing stroke or TIA. Certainly regular exercise, four days a week, 30 minutes each time uh, is associated with um, uh, fewer uh, cardiac uh, uh, complications. And so that, that's certainly something, um, so something to think about. Um, Ed, you mentioned a couple other things. Can you remind, oh, supplements. Supplements, um, no evidence to suggest that certain supplements um, reduce, reduce your risk of stroke or TIA. Um, again, difficult trials to do. Um, and generally where doctors are left with supplements is saying, we don't have any evidence that they help, but we don't have any evidence that they hurt. And so, you know, you, you can make your own decision about that. Um, was there another, another? Did, uh, did I miss you mentioning steps? I have my watch here to calibrate whatever you tell me to do, Dr. McDermott. Yeah, so steps, we you know, <laughs> regular, exer regular aerobic exercise is more important than a certain step threshold um, in, in, in not just preventing stroke or TIA, TIA but cardiovascular disease in general. Um, so I think, yeah, I think those are the... Yeah, I think, I think you hit upon, I think you hit upon all of those. Perfect, and then the next question, um, let's see, has there been any association shown between COVID and TI? Um, I can I can start and then uh, Dr. McDermott, if you want to jump in. Sure. Um, interesting, uh, COVID and stroke, certainly we've seen an association. Uh, COVID has been a really, really huge challenge, as everyone knows, over the past uh, year plus, and we're we're still trying to understand all of the effects of this virus and, and hopefully um, the virus will continue to go down and we'll have less and less issues from it. We have certainly seen in populations that have been more affected by COVID that they have had more, um, more blood clot formation and that blood clot formation has certainly in some cases led to more significant strokes. Um, there have been some cases uh, similar to the question that was asked previously by one of the audience members of um, younger people that don't have very much in the way of risk factors having very significant strokes due to clot formation in their body, in their brain. Um, and again, that's still not well understood, but we have certainly seen an increase in risk uh, for patients to have strokes as a result of having a COVID infection in their lifetime. Um, I have not seen uh, anything that'll cause a stroke risk would also increase, of course, a TIA risk. I've not, I've not seen that specific intersection, but I would say that COVID has certainly increased our stroke risk in our patients. Thank you. Anything to add, Dr. McDermott? Uh, I would just, yeah, I, I completely agree. There's definitely a, an association there. I'd also add that any disease that makes you really sick is going to increase your stroke risk. People who are really sick have strokes. And so, you know, if it were even just influenza B and you were really sick, your stroke risk would go up from that. And so uh, in, these, in these studies of COVID, we try to tease out, is there something unique about COVID beyond just the fact that if you're really sick, your stroke risk is increased? Thank you. Thank you both for that. The, the next question that we have up, would cigar smoking, e-cigarettes, vaping be considered a risk factor. They're looking for clarification for people who think perhaps cigars are somehow different from cigarettes. Yeah, so, the, so all of those things mentioned are risk factors for, for TIA and stroke, um, unfortunately. Yep, they're all, all uh, not good <laughs> for, 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 for preventing TIA and stroke. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. McDermott. Um, is there anything um, that you think we've missed um, for, in terms of parting thoughts? Is there, are there any uh, important messages that you wanna push out? Are there any really important themes that we perhaps missed and you'd like to draw attention to? Uh, and I don't think we've necessarily missed them, but you know, a, a parting thought from me for sure will be to, again, to remind our audience that while we're talking a lot about TIAs or transient uh, uh, strokes, uh, the important information is that at home, when you have one of these, uh, you'll never know if it's a TIA or a stroke. You want to make sure that you help yourself as much as possible, which means call 911, get an ambulance, come to the hospital, let us do all the studies, the testing necessary to figure out if you 
uh, have had a stroke or a TIA or if you need further therapy, the best chance you'll have to get back to normal and have all those, uh, those neurologic deficits to go away will be to come into the hospital as quickly as possible. And to help with that, again, please remember the acronym FAST, which is, you know, uh, F as in face, any kind of facial droop, A for arm or leg numbness or weakness that's sudden in onset, um, S for speech, any trouble with speech, um, vision will throw in there as well. And then T is time. So time matters. The faster you get into the hospital, the faster you get the therapies, the higher your chances of returning back to normal. So call 911 and come into the hospital as quickly as possible. And Dr. Salzner, you. you know, was Keith was, you know, was clear that calling 911 is the right thing. That's for two reasons. Um, number one, you don't know if your symptoms are going to worsen. Uh, and so either driving yourself or being the passenger in a car when your symptoms worsen is not a good situation to find yourself in. And so calling 911 is helpful in that way because you have trained medical personnel who are there if things, get, if things go downhill. Um, the other reason is that our triage systems are built around patients coming into the hospital via 911 when they think they've had a stroke or TIA. So we're able to quickly evaluate patients that come in through the door in a stretcher and do all of the things we need to do really, really quickly. Things go slow, more slowly if you're coming in through the door just as an ambulatory patient. And no one will blame you for calling 911 if you think you're having a stroke or TIA, even if your symptoms resolve. Let's say your symptoms have resolved by the time you get to the emergency room. We'll say, good job. You did the right thing. That, 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 was, the, that was what you were supposed to do. Thank you. Thank you both for these, uh, for these answers. Um, and as we wrap up, could you tell our audience about the Michigan Medicine Comprehensive Stroke Program? Yeah, sure, Ed. Uh, you know, again, um, we're very, very fortunate in this area. We have some amazing medical care. We have amazing pre-hospital care uh, with our ambulance uh, companies, and the training is exceptional. Um, at Michigan Medicine, we are a comprehensive stroke center. Uh, that's a joint commission certification, which means that it's a truly uh, collaborative and multidisciplinary approach with multiple different departments that come together with the one uh, clear priority, which is to help our patients that are suffering from a stroke or a TIA. So, um, for instance, if you were to come into the into the emergency uh, department with any of these symptoms, you would be met at the door by emergency department personnel, as well as uh, vascular neurology personnel. You would get your imaging done by radiology, and should you need um, any therapies, they are all available at a comprehensive stroke program. That means that it's that it's at the pinnacle or the highest level of stroke treatment uh, available. So that includes all interventions, such as what we were talking about earlier. If you need to have a thrombectomy where somebody has to, you know, a, a surgeon has to go in through the groin and, and pull a clot out of your brain uh, to treating you with the, the clot busting medicine through the IV all the way to things like um, research opportunities for uh, national and international clinical trials to help our patients from stroke. We have all of those available being at that pinnacle of, um, of stroke treatment program. So again, we're very fortunate in this community. And uh, again, parting thought from me is if you have these sudden severe sim sudden symptoms, please call 911, get into the hospital, let us, let us help you. Yeah, and I would add to that that being at a comprehensive stroke center is so important at the, in the early hours uh, of having a stroke because we can deliver acute treatment, make sure you're appropriately diagnosed and, and things like that. After people have had a stroke, there's also a benefit of being at a comprehensive stroke center because we have specially stroke trained nurses, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists. We, these are providers with a special interest in stroke and special training in stroke who basically have dedicated their careers to helping patients after stroke get better. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you to our audience for the um, very uh, good list of questions that we had and for tuning in. And thank you to our experts, Dr. McDermott, Dr. Sosna. Thank you for your expertise and, and for your time. Have a good afternoon. Thanks. Thanks, you as well.